what kind of a philosophy are you trying to project through your art? Because uh, you've got rave reviews. When I when I was going through some of the uh, things that I that are there on the net on the internet, I see that you've got rave reviews for your Thank soul you. cages, right? Uh, so what is it that you're going to uh, do from there on? I'm I'm not speaking of soul cages per se, sure. but also moving ahead. When I had performed soul cages in one of the locations, there was one audience comment that um, that I want to um, want to narrate, and the comment was very simply this. Thank you for liberating Bharatanatyam from its cage. And it couldn't have been put in a better way. What is this cage? What is this box? Now, Bharatanatyam has lived in a box by, um, by its history, by, by all the social context that it has gone through. The box that I refer to is that of religion. And why does religion sometimes become a box? It's because you are trying to contextualize everything done in Bharatanatyam to a sense of spirituality, of religion. Even if it is as remote and as abstruse as having a very physical relationship of the heroine with the hero, you're still trying to contextualize it in a spiritual garb. This whole spiritualizing projects, I think, much more in India? Yes, compared to, say, ballet or, or other forms of art. Um, this, this spiritualizing, it, and it is common to all dance forms, all classical dance forms of India. And this spiritualizing, this, this aspect of Bharatanatyam, I feel has unfortunately limited it. And limited it largely because of the content that it is expected to deliver. That no matter what you deliver, there is this connection that I'm always talking to God even if I'm telling him that I really long to be kissed by his tender lips, it is still the Jivatma Paramatma, the Jivatma being the, the grosser self seeking for union with a supreme self. A teenager who was born and brought up in today's time finds this very out of sync with how they have, they have been raised. And even, even audience goers are you know, finding the, the rational side of their mind, questioning how does this really sit well with their own personal philosophy. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to take out this demand of Bharatanatyam being connected to a spiritual um, realm um, of having any sort of box. Why should it be limited by any box? Um, let's use it for what it is meant. It is a medium. It's a beautiful medium. I'm completely convinced that it is probably one of the best art forms that can be used to tell stories, which we as Indians are wonderful at. So let's go back. Let's use Bharatanatyam as the paint and let's tell beautiful stories. Let's make a canvas and not be worried about having any limitations for how it needs to be viewed. So my philosophy stems from that. Um, what do I hope to communicate? Is it a particular sectarian philosophy? None at all. It's just the storyline. and It's a narrative that actually interests you, the narrative patterns, the narrative, right. the vivacity of the narrative uh, itself. Yes, right? absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, but then, uh, since you spoke about spirituality, spirituality sells, right? Especially soft spirituality that comes through in art is something that sells hugely, mm. I think especially when you package it in the right way to the West. This is something that I have been noticing with art in India in a very general sense. How do you respond to that? <laughs> it almost uh, seems very suggestive there, Meena. <laughs> um, true. Um, as much as spirituality sells, I think the, the, um, the point is to not is to not market it in that way of um, of taking the spirituality and letting stories where my God is shown in a poorer light than I imagine him. To me, somehow, I would find that very difficult to reconcile. I do not want to see my Krishna as a cheating husband or someone that I could go to when my husband is away and ask him to come to me because my mother-in-law is sleeping or my father-in-law is hard to hear or you know these kinds of these kinds of relationships with that krishna is is to me pandering and the west needs to know of a deeper 
India than just the soft spirituality. And Bharatanatyam can, in just its beauty and its transcendence of the form, become spiritual in the experience that you have. And you don't need to have the guise of these stories. This, this is a fantastic uh, answer, I think, because, see, if you noticed, we began with aesthetics, we moved on to politics, <laughs> uh, we then moved on actually to the philosophical, and we come to the ethical now. Right. So we are actually looking at different aspects and the way in which this art could grow by addressing these different aspects of, uh, you know, that need to be taken into account. But in the gamut, within the gamut of all these, uh, you know, things that we have been discussing, as a woman, <laughs> as a woman, as an academic, uh, who is asking you questions at this particular point of time, something that has bothered me as a, as a Sahadeya, maybe, if you could call it that, is the problem of the gaze in Paratnatyam. You know? So, do you have a problem with that as a, as a, as a woman performing? And by gaze, what uh, specifically the, do you mean? The way, you know, the body is represented on stage, the way the woman's body is looked at, how, where is the camera, what is it focusing on? Are you talking sheer, of sheer art, of pure art, or is there something more to it? Now, there is a side of it. The minute, minute you, you are performing on stage, um, the, um, the body, my body becomes a vehicle and certainly it is viewed in in many ways now do I have to do I have to openly be suggestive that my body is is only capable of a certain kind of viewership is my question can I engage Bharatanatyam in a way where I don't have to be that kind of a woman where I can portray anything because it it really should be that it should only be a vehicle for communication. Eroticism, which is the mainstay of what Bharatanatyam in the traditional sense is performed even today, does have a gaze where the woman is looked upon as, um, as seeking, as seeking uh, salvation through a physicality, through a physical expression of that sensual love. And while you are supposed to still transform that physical action that I'm communicating overtly on stage again and again in every piece I do, I'm not sure if you know, viewers are aware of it, but apart from you know, a couple of pieces in the traditional margam as we call it, the varnam, the main piece, is all about the pining. Mm -hmm. The padams and the javalis which follow are also about Know, different situations where the heroine is imagining or has seen her lover be deceitful. So there is a very deep sensuality. And how do you present that always and not have a response that only looks at the physical dimension? I challenge a dancer to be able to do that. Because if I was indeed showing you God on stage, then you should all be liberated. So you're talking about an art which liberates the body, right? Which has yeah. uh, certain emancipatory possibilities right. as far as both the body is concerned and the gaze is concerned. The yes. gaze of the other is yes. concerned. Okay. So okay. then I want to see all the emancipated audiences. And where are they? I think uh, in the final part of uh, this interview, I would like to focus on your life as a dancer. Could you, could you tell us something about where it all began and uh, how has art changed your life and how has your life qualified your art? I started learning dance at a very young age. My influences for why I wanted to learn dance came largely because of location. I lived right across from Shanmugananda Hall, which was where all the doings of the art form of, of all kinds of uh, classical dance uh, would come and perform and I had free access both to them on stage as well as off stage because I was so little and so well known to all of the the watchmen as we called uh, them in those days that I would be allowed to go go just about anywhere and I fell in love with the art form it was everything that one could dream of in that age of of relative simplicity and my training in this art form took me to 
some wonderful teachers. I've been trained by Mahalingam Pillai in Mumbai, in um, Chennai by uh, the Dhananjans, as well as Adyar K. Lakshman. Artists who have um, not only the passion, but the, a fund of knowledge for how this art form needs to be performed. So I imbibed all of that with a view of sticking, adhering to just what I was taught for years. And I think that played a very important role. One needs to know what the tradition is before stepping out. And that tradition was passed on to me. And what luckily happened to me was my departure to go to the, uh, go to the United States. And I say that luckily because often when you are always exposed to the art, you lose a sense of value for it. And when I was far removed from my, um, my center for art, I suddenly realized everything that I could have learned, but I didn't. And being so far away, it also provided me with this safety net to experiment. Because nobody was watching. And that is important in, a, in, a, in the journey of an artist. So I could safely experiment, having had the years of tradition as a backing, and I'm positive some of those experiments I would uh, never, ever stage. But what has evolved with time is a sense that it is not okay to be a dancer where the view, the focus is always on me and the aesthetics of how well I have danced, how well I've executed this particular movement, and if there is anybody else that can make a geometric shape better than me. That is not what dance needs to be about. It needs to rise above that. And loss of viewership, loss of audiences, either because they're on their texting, on their phones texting, or they've just outright walked out. All these were messages that I had to internalize over time. And I decided that I cannot be accepting of a situation where my audience is bored. That onus is on me. I can never blame the audience if they are disengaged with it. I have to find a way to engage them and hence the, the change came over and everything that I'm doing now is about that. I was also told that you began your career uh, in one sense as a professional who was completely removed from the art scenario, right? <laughs> uh, because right. we're doing your PhD abroad on neurophysics? Neuroscience, right. Neuroscience. Yeah. Okay. My background uh, in the academic world was actually on degenerative diseases of the brain. A very far removed field, I was in the pharmaceutical industry and then I moved on to education. My travel to the US was linked with that. Um, why you might ask, I think that's the, the uh, baggage I have of being born in a Tambram family. That uh, dance is something that you were allowed to pursue as long as it remained a hobby and it had a place in its life. But you, as a professional, had to seek out an academic pursuit. Um, the brain always won over the body. And so my, um, my rediscovery of myself, it's not as though I ever abandoned dance during the entire process of, of being or becoming this um, academician. I kept in touch with it because I, as soon as I went there, as I said, the value for the art became apparent and I was called to teach. So having students, you have to keep yourself on your toes. And if you don't, they make sure that you are. Um, so I've, I've been lucky in that way in, in several ways in having students and continuing the art. And at several points, I think I've tried to abandon my, my academic side and um, never been quite able to until more recently in the past three years. I've, I've um, um, as they say, chucked it all up for my true love, if you might call that uh, my first love, to go back to um, dance and dedicate myself to it. What are the future projects? Uh, what is it that you're doing right now and uh, anything that is your dream that you have planned for the future as far as your art form is concerned? Right. You mentioned soul cages and that was my foyer into this sort of exploration. Um, proceeding more along the same lines um, with my next production, Yud, which is premiering in February. And then I have another production titled One by X that's 
to premier later in next year. The, the dream is to not be the only person doing this. Because every time I step on the stage, I look at the audience and, and the conviction with which they tell me that they will come back to see my show. Unfortunately, it also means to me that I have to do that many shows to get that many more people convinced of this art form. And what I would like to see then is, is more people participating on this side of the stage, join me, and, and that way this art form will truly get preserved and not just be put away in a museum and talked about as, yes, yes, we have a wonderful culture. I think, Savita, with the kind of theorizing that you're doing with also, I mean, in addition to the wonderful performances that you make, the kind of theorizing, the kind of uh, critique that you are doing with the art form will definitely go a long way in strengthening the art form of Paratnatyam. And I hope that this is also something that you will be doing along with your performances. I, I would like to wish you the very best in, in your future projects. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Meena. This is the war that has been fought for a million years. This is a war that may continue for a million years more.